As soon as he was elected, Long was quick to basically fire everyone that politically disagreed with him in the office and replace them with his followers, who took money out of their salary and put it into his campaign, 10% to be exact. Passing everything that basically anyone with any power disagreed with, Long found himself at odds with both the media and the wealthy, but his swift aggressiveness gave him a cult following with the poor. Some stuff he did was great, like making sure school children had access to free books. Other things were quite controversial. He sent the National Guard on a war on gambling houses and brothels, and he ordered all, all possible force to be utilized. This wasn't the best look, as local newspapers put out pictures of these National Guardsmen searching naked women. When told by the press that an official said he didn't want Long's support via force, Long gave the Gen Z-style response of, word for word, nobody asked him for his opinion anyways. After proposing an idea to raise taxes on oil, the most sacred American condiment, Long was put up for impeachment. Both sides were willing to do whatever it took to get their way, including bribery. It was much easier for Long to simply get the one-third vote to vote in his favor to avoid the impeachment, and after bribing 15 Louisiana senators in a round-robin vote, which is a random order to prevent a ringleader, he avoided impeachment. He then proceeded to do the Huey Long thing of making everyone that ever tried to impeach him's political career miserable, challenging their every mood. Move. Receiving death, th death threats at this point, Long started hiring bodyguards that eventually became called Cossacks. By this point, he was called the Kingfish after a radio show character. Running for U.S. Senator in 1930, he infamously challenged his campaign uh, as a referendum and promised to resign from governor if the people truly disagreed with him and did vote him as a senator. Even more well-known is the story of critic Sam Irby, who disappeared days before the election and reappeared the day after, somehow saying he staged his own kidnapping when all the evidence pointed at Long. As the governor and senator-elect, he kept his Jacksonian attitude, yelling shut up at opposing legislators and somehow passing 44 bills in two hours. Although he seems like a dictator, it's crucial to remember that he accomplished things for the poor that no one had done in decades. He increased enrollment in school by 20% and created the economic concept of attributed scarcity with his banned production of cotton for a year that Egypt actually went along with. Guess who's back, back, back again. So all the events that Tran just described uh, happened during Huey Long's governorship between 1928 and 1932. And the time period between 1928 and 1932 is very significant in American history. And to see why, let's check out how the economy is doing in this time period. So as we can see here, this is real GDP, this is time. Initially, the US economy is doing pretty well. I mean, there's a lot of inequality, but you know, who cares about the poor people? Uh, but oh, it's 1929, uh, the stock market crashes, crashes, I guess you should have cared about those poor people now. Oh, the economy, it, it, it just keeps getting worse. Oh no, oh no. This kind of total economic collapse made a lot of people very poor, and by extension, it made a large amount of people very sad. Or if you're a vocab nerd, you could say it made a great amount of people very depressed. The massive melancholy honestly deserves its own video. However, what you have to understand for the sake of this video is that during the substantial desolation, everyone in America was basically poor and starving and homeless. Everyone, except for those in Huey Long's Louisiana. Turns out, Huey Long's policies of spending big and helping the poor staved off the worst effects of the Depression in Louisiana. So while everybody in the country was doing this, the people of Louisiana were doing this. And this got him quite a bit of national attention. Here was this random farm boy who took complete control of a backwater rural state and transformed it into an economic role model for all the other states to follow. And during the significant tragedy, no less, Huey Long had arguably become the most popular politician in the entire country. And immediately after this governorship ended, he used this popularity to win himself a U.S. Senate seat in 1932. Huey Long, as senator, characteristically made fiery speeches against wealth inequality and criticized both the GOP and the Democrats for their ineptitude in regards to handling the, fi the current financial crisis. And during the 1932 presidential campaign, Long endorsed arguably the second most popular politician in America, a certain Franklin Delano Roosevelt, and was instrumental in helping him become president of the United States by securing key Southern votes for him. Now, the relationship between Huey Long and FDR was an incredibly testy one. While FDR and Huey Long both agreed on the kind of radical economic change that needed to occur, they both disagreed on how far that, econo that radicalness should go. In particular, Huey Long was very critical of FDR's New Deal program, saying that the social programs it offered didn't go far enough. And, quite interestingly, a lot of people in the country agreed. While the New Deal had certainly alleviated the pains of the Depression, it certainly hadn't stopped it. In 1934, Long introduced his Share Our Wealth program, an alternative to the New Deal. Notable features include capping net worths at $100 million, limiting annual income to $1 million, creating a universal basic income of $5,000 a year, and a wide variety of other radical left-wing proposals. His programs never passed because most senators and economists considered them unfeasible, and to be fair, they were. However, these programs made him a lot more popular nationwide, and it forced FDR's second New Deal to become a lot more radically left-wing, giving us policies like Social Security. However, at this point, FDR was becoming incredibly afraid of Huey Long and his popularity. He was probably the only person who could actually defeat FDR in a general election, 
Well, besides Douglas MacArthur, but once again, he deserves his own video. Ever the opportunist, Huey Long, unlike MacArthur, decided to run against FDR in the 1936 election. And, to be honest, he probably would have won. I'm serious, that's how popular the guy was. Like, he was this close to upstaging one of our greatest presidents of all time. Unfortunately, that wasn't to be. See, at this point, Huey Long had made quite a lot of enemies, for reasons I couldn't possibly tell you. September 8th, 1935, Long went to the state capitol to pass a bill that would gerrymander the district of an opponent. The opponent's son-in-law, a certain Carl Weiss, shot Huey Long as he was leaving the state capitol building. On September 10th, 1935, Huey Long was pronounced dead, ironically assassinated by the very opponents he so easily disregarded. The legacy of the Kingfish is a very complicated one. Huey Long's disregard for the democratic process cannot be ignored, and it's very reasonable to assume that had he not been assassinated, the dictator of Louisiana could have very easily become the dictator of the United States. However, he genuinely helped people, particularly the poor. Damn stealing this from PBS, but Huey Long is the reason Louisiana ain't Mississippi. I guess the fundamental question of Huey Long was, was he right? Is it okay to sacrifice age-old democratic institutions if you're actually helping people? I guess fundamentally, that's for you to decide my 20 loyal subscribers. There'll be peace without end, every neighbor a friend, with every man a 